There is a particular kind of show that I always find myself gravitating towards unconsciously. It's, it's the type that specifically focuses on either the, the inner workings of making anime or the culture surrounding it. See, what they do is that they take a small portion of what we know to be the anime making process and then expand further to inform us of the, the trials and tribulations of making the very media that we have come to enjoy. Back in 2015, I ended up watching a show that quickly became one of my favorites of all time, Shiro Bako. It covered the anime making process as seen from the eyes of a production assistant in an anime studio. But as great as this series is, and believe me, it is superb. There was one glaring section of the industry that I thought it was rather lax on. Voice acting. Sure, Shiro Bako had a character devoted to that section of the industry, but throughout the show's 24 episode run, she never really got as much focus as the others. Thankfully for me, 2015 also had another separate anime series that filled in the gap quite nicely. It covered the struggles of being a seiyuu in Japan while also being surprisingly informative about various parts of the industry viewed from that perspective. Ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Okada, and today on Glass Reflection we are looking at the 2015 anime series from Gonzo, based on the work by Masumi Asa. Saves life. Let's jam. <laughs> Futaba Ichinose is a rookie voice actress who is extremely unsure of her own abilities. She's shy, easily distracted, and constantly overthinks everything she needs to do on a regular basis. She is one of three seiyuu that the series focuses on to showcase a potentially rose-colored look at the industry. Futaba, alongside her fellow seiyuu, the energetic Princess of Strawberries Ichigo, and the young but seasoned Rin, start off by all being cast for an anime series Buddha fighter Bohistvon? Bohistvon. It's a mecha anime series that, despite its weird title and logo, has no relation to Neon Genesis Evangelion. While Rin and Ichigo perform their roles as operator and large chested girl, respectively, Futaba's few lines as the show's mascot character Pipo leave her frustrated and anxious, even more so when she's asked to do some impromptu lines of a secondary character, and, you know, after failing the first several attempts, gets passed on as one of her senpais is asked to come in and do it in her stead. This is what the series is about, the sometimes harsh reality of the voice acting business and the internal thoughts of one rookie who is just trying to do her best and weather the storm. Throughout the series, Futaba is thrown into a variety of different jobs, from narration to foreign film dubbing to running a web radio show alongside her fellow seiyuu. For most of these jobs, she ends up being the same bundle of nerves and anxiety that she showcases in episode 1, but eventually, with experience and advice from the rest of the cast, she starts to become more comfortable in her roles and in her life as a seiyuu only to get discouraged again and start over, as is the way of this industry. What I really like, though, is how the series is structured. Each episode focuses on a different aspect of the voice acting industry as a whole, as indicated by the episode's title. Recording, auditions, starting a unit, being part of an event. And between the three main leads, the show is able to show off how each of these parts work. They even left an episode dedicated to the role of manager, which replays a number of scenes from previous episodes, but from the perspective of Futaba's rookie manager, Kono. One of the reasons, though, that this show was able to get so much of the little details right about the industry and the, the plight of rookie Seiyu was the fact that the original material was written by one. The original manga was written by Masumi Asano, a voice actress who has been in the industry since the early 2000s. While she is no longer a rookie by any stretch of the imagination, many of the situations that we find Futaba in can be traced back to a point in Asano's own career. For example, in one episode we see that Futaba had a part in a drama CD, playing the role of little sister to the queen of Sundere, Rie Kugumiya. Previously, Asano had roles in both the drama CD and television anime for Shakugan no Shana, both of which had Kugumiya playing the lead. This is, of course, not including their work together in the anime production of Hayate the Combat Butler. There's a nice little circle of people that we keep going through. And also, there's the little technical tidbit that both Seiyu's life and Hayate the Combat Butler take place in the same universe, 
apparently, but the crossover between the two is small enough that they rarely interact. But there are a lot of crossovers with a variety of personalities from the industry, though. In each episode of Seiyu's Life, a well-known name like Kugamiya appears to play themselves and give advice to the, the cast about the particular facet of the industry that that episode focuses on. This all leads to a story that has gotten even more interesting as time passes because, you know, when you have a story about rookie Seiyu, who do you get to actually voice them? Well, in style, true to the story itself, you get rookie Seiyu. In particular, for the voice of Futaba, you get the formerly rookie actress Rie Takahashi. While Futaba was not Takahashi's first role, or even her first role with a named character, it was the first time that she held a show's lead role. And then, in less than a year, Takahashi went on to voice characters in two of more of the well-known anime series from 2016, with both Megumin from Konosuba and Amelia from ReZero. It does my heart good to see someone cast as this socially awkward but motivated and driven character to, to eventually find greater success on their own beyond the airing of this series. Not only that, but the series has relevance for the lead actresses in other ways. Along with their characters becoming part of a unit called Earphones and releasing their first single in the show, the actresses themselves actually recreated that and went on to continue to use earphones as a unit beyond the release of the show. This wasn't just some one-off thing. They made this work, and simply for that, I applaud them. It's just the little things that this show gets so right that makes up for everything else. Because on the surface, this series doesn't look like anything special. The designs and animation are simple, and the characters' personalities, barring their occupations, are nothing particularly noteworthy. But the staff behind this series of rookie voice actresses trying to make a name for themselves was still able to take that and add in enough polish in other ways to make the series interesting. I'm happy that this got the adaptation that it did, especially when there are so few anime that focus on this topic. Like legit, I can count the number of anime that focuses on the occupation of voice acting exclusively on one hand, two of which have questionable scenes in them that I wouldn't always be comfortable recommending, and a third which just stars a big piece of shit who is still somehow entertaining to watch, regardless of how horrible her personality is. Despite how important voice acting is to the anime industry, and despite the way that it has become an idealized dream job for many on both sides of the ocean, we rarely see this sort of story put to screen in any form. So when we do get them, I will be gunning for a front row seat because this sort of thing just fascinates me. The more depressing thing, of course, is that the show sets up a, a potential sequel that will never occur. The ending specifically leaves open a challenge for Futaba to overcome in the following year or risk having to quit being a seiyuu, but it's a finale that we'll never see animated because, well, the manga hasn't even made it that far. Heck, as far as I'm able to tell, even though, like, the manga's never been officially brought over, is that despite being listed as ongoing, the manga ends even before the live concert in episode 12, let alone what happens beyond the show itself. Combined with its less than stellar amount of popularity, the chances of seeing the story beyond this season is unlikely. But you know, it's also depressing in other ways, because this show is about voice acting. And it never got dubbed. Like, like I know, I know, it's, it's a bit of a niche show, but when Funimation first grabbed the license to the series, I was extremely excited. I wanted to see what they would do with it, how they would handle the various guest spots by famous Japanese actors, what they would do for the ending sequences where the leads all sing, usually sprout some personal anecdotes during a 15 second free talk, and then do a brief karaoke session singing songs from Evangelion, Nadesco, and Slayers. But ultimately, their solution to that was to just release a sub-only DVD and leave it at that. Like, really? Come on. Like, I know that I'm extremely passionate about the show, more so than anyone else I know. Like, I went and I bought a Futaba Nendroid at Anime Expo last year and walked out of that place feeling as if I had successfully smuggled contraband despite the reality that I was probably the only one at the event who cared enough about this series to actually buy any merch related to it. But it shows like this that spawned my love for anime as a whole for, for so long. 
like back in the day, I used to recommend shows like Genshikin that focused on the, the Japanese fan base of anime and how they go about showing their love and enthusiasm for the medium. I'll still spend time talking about shows like Comic Party and Dojin Work that do similar things. I will shove Shirobako into the watch queue of anyone who will listen because these shows and, and Seiyu's life are the few that show us another side of all of this. They show us the parts of how anime are, are created and viewed with a variety of different perspectives, and anything that does that, I will watch with enthusiasm from this day until my last day. So it should go without saying that I would like to present Seiyu's Life with the overall rating of Certified Frosty, a rating that I reserve for only the best of the best, and those shows too important to ignore. Sure, if the lack of buzz is any indication, there are many out there who would not find this series that worthwhile, and I'm not naive enough to believe that many people just haven't heard of this show before, and by making this video I am somehow spreading the word, but on the off chance that I can somehow reach the ears of at least one person who would be interested in and love this show to pieces as much as I do, I could not help but make this video. If my passion has piqued your interest in any way, you can find copies of the sub-DVD online, or more conveniently, you can watch the series on Crunchyroll, and I'll add links in the description for both situations. A very special thank you to all of my patrons who not only support my work in general, but allow me to do videos where, where I can just more easily talk about these more obscure shows that I'm passionate about instead of only sticking with the bigger blockbusters every video. I do love and appreciate you all. Specifically though, as I do, I want to give particular shoutouts to patrons Calhoun Boy, Siri Yamiko, Victor Eckmark, Rifen Bonaparte, Rune Jacobson, and Joshua Garcia for being extremely awesome. You guys are great. And until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, watch more anime and stay frosty.